Hey, what's going on family? Good evening, good evening everyone. I pray that everybody's having a great day. What's up everybody? I hope everybody's doing well. God bless you, God speed, God there for you, God in your presence is in your midst. Hey, whatever you need from him, I pray he's fulfilling that desire. I just wanna welcome you in tonight to our Kingdom Bible study. I'm excited, I really am. Um, I, I thought I was going to uh, have a different title, but of course I got two more watches if you watched last week. If you didn't watch last Wednesday Bible study, I'm gonna implore and encourage you to go do that uh, because it's gonna be central to what we're going into tonight. Night. Um, and this is just part three of it, which is entitled Stop Watching Me Sleep. Yeah, stop watching me sleep. And I think it's important and it's imperative for us to understand that from a theological perspective, largely because as it relates to sleeping and praying and watching in the Bible, in certain instances, in most instances, actually, when you have sleep, it's contrary to watch. Right. You, you can't sleep and watch the same way in the physical, such as it is in the spiritual, when you use it in the right um, con context, because uh, there are different ways sleep is used, but primarily it's used as a state of immobility, which I'll get into in just a moment. But when you understand that God tells you to pray without ceasing and then he tells his disciples in Matthew 26 to watch and pray, you have to also understand that every distraction from your prayer life is a sleep life. Say it again, every distraction from your prayer life is a sleep life, meaning when you don't pray, you're sleeping. If he says pray without ceasing, that means I'm supposed to be in continual prayer. There's supposed to be a continual drop, right? There's gonna be a continual dripping of prayer throughout my life. And it's not to say that I'm supposed to be on my knees 24 seven. That's the posture of prayer. And just because people get in postures don't mean they're praying. Say it again, young man. Just because people get in the right posture doesn't mean they're praying correctly or they're having the right set of prayers. Prayer is not a posture. Prayer is a presence. Prayer is essentially a, 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 a intend, intended or it has its intentions in to remain in the presence of God, to have constant communication with God that, watch this, whenever there is a circumstance, there's always a conversation. Say it again. So whenever there's a circumstance, there's always a conversation. Nothing can happen in my life before I talk to God about my life. If I do, if I if I make a decision about my life before I talk to him about my life, then I'm doing things without praying. That means my prayer has ceased. And now I'm having circumstances that's dictating my conversation with God versus me having a conversation with God that's dictating my circumstances. I need to be able to talk to my circumstances about my God and stop talking to my God about my circumstances. It's a proactive way of living. It's a it's a consciousness. It's a it's a revelatory uh, commitment to say that I want to stay in constant communication even on the bad days, even when I don't feel like it, even when I made bad choices, even when I made bad decisions. It's not, it's not a, it's not a, um, it's not a, re a religious or nation that says I'm supposed to do this in righteousness or in my own self-righteousness. No, it's a mandate that says despite of me, I'm supposed to be where he wants me to be. Regardless of what I'm going through, I need to pray. Regardless of what I'm, I'm in, I need to pray. I need to pray when my mind is cloudy. I need to pray when my mind is clear. I need to pray when my pocketbook is full. I need to pray when my pocketbook is empty. God should not be, as Corey Tim Bone put it, a spare tire. He should be a steering wheel. He should be guiding our life and not just helping us get to the next destination. It's supposed to be a constant communication a constant involvement of his presence that we get a steady, what I heard Bill John say, a steady dripping from him. It's a, it's a constant flow. And what, what it reminded me of, and I, and I said this before, which I think is worth repeating, it reminded me of when we will have freezing in Texas and you will get the notes and the reminders that you're supposed to leave your faucets dripping consistently. Why? So that the pipes won't burst and that you won't have an explosion of, uh, of more damage that, that, that the freezing will cause if you would not have had dripping. That's what prayer without ceasing looks like. It's, it looks like a constant dripping of flow that doesn't allow an explosion to happen before the freezing is over, before the temperature changes, before you're enduring whatever situation you're in. And I just want to pause for a moment because that's my intro, but I can't keep going without doing what I just said. So let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you right now for this time. We thank you for your presence. We thank you, Father God, for being in our midst, for touching us, for healing us, for correcting us and rebuking us in righteousness. Father God, you said that is your word. Your word does it out of love. You do it out of your love for us. And your word is a convictor to our souls. And I pray right now that we, uh, Father, don't just filter your word through our own filters, but we allow your word to change our filters. We allow it to re uh, imagine the things that we've imagined previously, that we renew our minds, that we reshape our thoughts, that we have a different perspective and a different um, a point of view of living, Father, because we know we're not at the ultimate place of thinking. We can always improve. We're not you, Father God. So there's always room for growth. You are final. You are the conclusion of everything. You are the beginning and the end. You are the first and the last. There is no more growth with you. You can't grow because you're all in all. You're all encompassing, but you've given us the spirit to grow, the evolution and the elevation that we need inside of this spirit room to be more like you. That's why you say you're changing us into your son day over day. And I pray that we just continue to understand that the person we were yesterday is not necessarily the person we need to be tomorrow, that there is a different way we can think. There's a different line of sight. There's a different uh, active and activity we can commit on doing. And we can always be fluent, Father God, in our faith. We can always see it differently if we allow our eyes to be opened by you. So now, God, enlighten the eyes of our understanding that we may see you clearly, hear from you, and our faith may grow. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So listen, I'm talking about the four watches. Let me give a brief intro to last week. I'm talking about the four watches. We're in a series entitled Watch and Pray, uh, which I implore you, encourage you. If you didn't see uh, Sunday's message, uh, watch me hold it together. Go back and watch that message. If you didn't see last Wednesday, we did the first two watches of what we call the, the night watches. But we understand that the night watches are actually the start of a day, right? 6 p.m. Um, is the start of a day theologically and it should be the start of our day um, mentally and how we how we proactively get in front of the next day or what we call the next day it should be a, a beginning and not an ending we, we approach life um, actually in the inverse way of the kingdom the kingdom is always inverse to the culture say it again the kingdom is always inverse to the culture that means whatever you see the culture do the kingdom does the opposite whatever you see the culture approve the kingdom approves the opposite the God God is not he's he's not not going against the culture. He's set on what his standard is, but oftentimes the culture go, goes against the kingdom. And this is kind of one of those ways uh, that we think in, in terms of culture, because we think day means light. When the truth of the matter is day does mean light, but it just don't mean external light. It means internal light. And when you have that, 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 that internal light, it does not have to be externally lit for you to know the day has started. 6 p.m. in your Bible starts your day. It starts your first watch. It's the night watch. It starts at 6 p.m. and it goes to 9 p.m., which we talked about. And then the second watch is from 9 to 12. And let me give you, let me give you those again. The, the first watch, we, we, we uh, understand that most of the things, most of the things that the Bible talks talks about that happens in this watch, right? We, we want to put kind of a, a, a word or a concept to it so we can remember it. Most of the things that happen deals with what's called restorative intercession, restorative intercession. What does that mean? That means most of the time when you see something that happens between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. in your Bible, it has something to do with restoration and either somebody is interceding on that or God is interceding for us. It's, it's a period where re restoration typically happens between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. And you, if you think about your life that's when you typically most of people get off work right and we need to be restored mentally we need to be restored in our families we need to be restored in uh, certain things that we lost during the day there or during the, the hours before then I, I'm gonna say day but you know what I'm saying during the, the morning shift um, we, we've been drained we've been poor from because that's when as you can see in, in your Gospels that's when they came and found Jesus he was doing all this teaching and then the Bible says he would go off and relax why because he He's restoring himself. Come on. He's going to pray to get back ready for the next day. And we got to make sure that we don't do too much today that we don't get ready for the next day that we have a period of restoration. So restorative intercession and number two from 9 p.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, we, we entitled that as proactive, excuse me, protective 
revelation, protective revelation. What does that mean? That's during the hours where God will reveal to you that he's protecting you. That's where you will see coming into the midnight hour where God will, will, will protect, um, you know, Paul and Silas as they're in jail, where he will protect the children of Israel as they're about to leave out and go uh, into their wilderness and into the promised land, where he will protect uh, certain people that's doing things that when Saul was fighting, the Bible says he fought at midnight. Even God gave him that, that that um, revelation that he's protected. That's what you have to understand, because that's if you think about it, if especially if you have family or loved ones and they're out or um, uh, you don't know where they are, it's between those hours where your worry starts to increase. And it's at that point where you have to have a revelation of God protection over your life to say, I can't get to him, but you can. I can't help him, but you can. I can't cover him, but you can. You can you can disseminate your angels into places I can't touch. And that protective revelation and that hour God may be telling you, listen, while you're wide awake, while you're worrying, God may be telling you to watch and pray. And he may be telling you to 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 uh, to change the lenses, to change the output on what you're doing so that you can get responses. Uh, uh, I should say you should get you should get results, not necessarily responses so that you can get results. You want results. Right. So your responses has to change so you get the results you're looking for. And oftentimes we don't change our responses so we get the same results. If we worry about one thing, we'll worry about something else. If we worried about this, we worry about that. And it just replaces itself. And God is saying, this is the season where your worries should be transitioning to watching that you have to start watching and stop worrying that you have to start looking and stop uh, living a life that's uh, that's being reactive. But you have to start looking and living a life that's proactive. He will show you what you need to watch before your worry ever begins. Worry is typically and I said this and I'm going to say it again. Worry is typically the trigger that you should have been watching. That's in Matthew chapter six. Get a chance. You got to read that. Mur worry is typically the trigger that you should have been watching. So if I'm worrying, that means my eyes wasn't watching something I should have been watching. Come on here, somebody. Somebody say, I'm a watch. I'm a watch. I'm a watch. As you can see, I'm trying to teach this. So I'm going to keep uh, I'm going to keep this mellow tone. <laughs> Pray for me. You are supposed to be watching and praying anyway. But I'm going to try to keep this because I really want to insert something into you today about these last two. I really believe it's imperative to understand um, that that we deal with watching or looking. It's not just about vision, right? Uh, in terms of outlook, it's about uh, perspective in terms of circumspect or uh, as Paul says, you walk circumspectly that you're not just looking ahead, but you're looking around. I'm not afraid. Watch this. I'm not afraid to look behind me because I understand what's behind me would never catch up to me. But for me to be able to learn where I'm at, I got to see where I came from. So I can't be afraid to look in my past. Come on here. I can't be afraid to dig up some things in my past and look at the mistakes I made to look at uh, some of the errors, some of the decisions. I can't be afraid to look at the trending because if I don't recognize the trending, I'll repeat the cycle. If I don't recognize the trending, I'll repeat the cycle. So it's not just having vision to look forward. It's having the spectacles. It's having the, the, the focus. It's having the wherewithal and the courage to not just look ahead, but look around. You got to look at what's around you. You got to look at who's around you. You got to look at, watch this, you got to look at seasons where people around you shift and change, where in one season you had certain people in your circle and another piece, another season you have another person in your circle. Why? Because typically often, relatively often, you can tell, uh, you can tell where you're headed by who's around you. You can tell where you're going by who you're hanging with. And, 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 and I, I, I'm a firm believer that if you don't have somebody who grows with you, then if you haven't outgrown them, you stop growing. If you don't have a person that grows with you, if you have not yet outgrown them, that means you stop growing. Why? Because you became accustomed to your circle versus your circumspect, your, your vision. You're not, listen, you're not watching what's around you. You're comfortable with what's around you. You, 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 you become settled instead of continuing to strive because if you start to change your outlook, you would change what's around you and what's around you has to either grow with you or you outgrow it. I hope that makes sense. So I'm, I'm talking uh, and I'm using the subject 
stop watching me sleep. And the reason I'm using that, because again, watch sleep, right? Those contradictory, if you're watching, you shouldn't be sleeping. And if you're sleeping, you can't be watching. And we need to understand a little bit more about sleep and as it relates to the Bible. So I want, I want to give you this definition for sleep that God gave me. And, and I've read, you know, some King James version of, of, of the dictionary, which in the King James version of uh, the dictionary, it, it, it says that sleep is um, sleep is motionless or and I like this. It says the unemployment of rest for the body. I love that how it uses that word in that context. Motionless or unemployment of rest for the body. That means the body is not employed to do something. I love that very, very, very distinctive uh, definition. Again, sleep is used in different contexts. So you have other encyclopedias and you have other um, um, uh, literature that defines the Bible as an intermediate state um, between heaven and earth. You know, when you, when you talked about sleep as death, as a period or a state that you're in, where you're not neither here nor there, you're in the intermediate state. You have awareness, you have consciousness, but you're not in the place of fulfillment. And as I'm studying, as I'm going through and I'm, I'm reading my Bible, God gave me this definition I wanna share with you. He says, sleep is defined as the immobility of bodily functions despite of conscious mobility. Say it again. Sleep is defined as the immobility of bodily functions despite of conscious mobility. Meaning my consciousness is mobile, but the members of my body are not. My God. Meaning I can, I'm aware of what's happening, but I'm not doing anything to change it. Oh God. Meaning I can see what's about to transpire, but I'm limp and I'm crippled and, and my paralysis don't let me solve a problem that I see that's ahead of me. That's sleep. Sleep has nothing to do with your eyes being closed. It has everything to do with your vision being blocked out. Sleep has everything to do with your members not operating in according to your consciousness. Sleep has everything to do when you're not employing your functions and your body to, to do something that's about to make you unemployed or something that's about to bring you uh, some kind of danger or disaster sleep has something to do with the fact that you have a conscious awareness but you're not doing anything about you about what you're aware of come on here if I have the ability to, to recognize what's about to happen I should have the wherewithal to respond to it before it happens and if I don't respond to it before it happens that means I'm sleeping on what's about to happen oh God who Jesus and Proverbs chapter six and Proverbs chapter six, I want to go there. Proverbs chapter six, it, 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 it calls us out. And I say us, I'm talking about humans. Uh, Solomon calls us out because he compares us to ants. And, and, and his comparison is not to diminish or to demean us in terms of uh, um, our human, humanistic trait. But he was saying, like, if the ant can figure this out. Come on here. You who have reason and who have intellect and who are not discern thinking, you should be able to figure this out. What was he talking about? He was talking about how, how the ant, um, how the ant has to make sure he has supplies for a season that's on the way. It's Proverbs 6 and 6. It says, go to the ant, you sluggard. I mean, he, he cutthroat with it, right? He says, consider her ways and be wise, which has no captain, overseer, or ruler. Watch what she does. She says, he, but she provides for her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands. So shall poverty come upon you like a prowler, prowler and your need like an armed man. He says, if you cannot operate like the ant, the ant is a person, watch this, who does not sleep until it has its supply of seed. Say it again. Say it again. An uh, ant does not sleep until it has its supply of seed. Why? Because what the ant recognizes is that this season will change. So before the next season comes, I need to supply seed in my storage so that I can be prepared for the season that's ahead of me. Anytime you don't supply a seed, you operate in the future shortage. Anytime you don't supply a current seed in your life, you will operate in a future shortage. If you don't stop and supply yourself with your seed for today, your seasons of tomorrow will be in a shortage. That's what that's what Solomon is trying to get us to understand that your future seed is dependent on your current supply of seed. That what, what am I saying? Watch this. He says you need to put seed in before you put sleep in before you go to sleep. Make sure you got your seed. Now, I want you to hear this because this is going to make sense in a minute. What he's saying is before, listen, anytime you sleep, 
you need to ask yourself, did I put in seed? Because wherever you don't put in seed, you have a shortage. Okay? So before I go to seed, what kind of seed was embedded? What kind of seed was on, on my mind? What, 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 what kind of uh, things were I, what, were, was I dealing with in my thoughts? My ideas are seeds. My concepts are seeds. My thoughts from afar off are seeds. And if I don't check the seed before I, have a, before I go to sleep, then I'll wake up in a shortage. It's a principle that says, come on here, that whatever you see in your next season is because of the seed that you, pl you supplied in your current season. You got to start looking at your tomorrow as your next season. Come on here, somebody. I felt that prophetically. You got to start looking at tomorrow as your, as your next season. Your, your season does. Matter of fact, ain't today, the, ain't today, that's bad English, but good thing. Ain't today the first, uh, first day of summer? I think it is. It's a new season. And guess what? It didn't get no, it didn't get no hotter night in Texas. It was hot last week. It's hot this week. It didn't, it didn't get no brighter. The sun is still shining. You can't even change. Clothes are still looking the same. Shoes are still looking the same. So what changed in terms of a season? The day. Your day can change your season. It does not have to depict or change in terms of a cataclysmic uh, sort of imag uh, imaginable uh, reference of change. Meaning you don't have to see this big, uh, humongous change happen in your life for you to know it changed. And when it changes, it changes. When you're done, you're done. When the season is over, it's over. And you have to be able to prepare yourself for the next season by supplying seed in this season. This, 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 um, this actually uh, builds on the concept that I want to dig into, and I'm hoping I'm helping somebody. I hope I'm helping somebody. If you scroll down in that same chapter in Proverbs 6, if you look at verses 20 through 22, this is what Solomon says later on in that chapter. He says, my son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. Watch what he says. Bind them continually upon your heart. Now, I can't get into definitions of mother and father in the context of what Solomon is using the proverbial wisdom. He's not necessarily talking about your, your, your physical parents because, because we know that all physical parents doesn't pose the same wisdom, but he's talking about incubation and source. And again, I can't get deeper deep into that because I stay there forever, but he's talking about when you get instructions from a, from, a, from a viable source and when you get cultivation from a person who's going to develop you you got to hold those things and you got to bind those things around your neck and around your heart he says tie them around your neck verse 22 when you roam they will lead you he says even when they they're not there their words will be there come on here come on my people with them great grandparents that you remember everything that grandma said that she ain't got to be there but, you, but her voice is that, that, that he ain't got to be there but grandpa voices that uncle ain't got to be there but you hear the wisdom even when he's afar off he says bind them around your, your neck because when you roam they will lead you when you sleep they will keep you and when you awake they will speak with you did you hear that he says when you roam it will it will lead you when you sleep it will keep you and when you wake up it's going to speak to you solomon is giving us like he's giving us the game right here he's saying listen if you if you grab hold to the right set of words and the right set of teaching even when you get lost that's roman right you used to have those phones at rome come on here somebody y'all know what i'm talking about those roman minutes don't call me my phone is roman i can't text you back it's roman it's gonna cost a higher price what that means that means it has no distinctive location it cannot find where it is in the earth so it's roaming right so when you're when you're lost he says the words will guide you back then he says when you're asleep the words keep you ha huh. it means watch this that even when you're not working the word is working on you that even when you're not awake, the word is awake in your life. That even when you're asleep, if you got the right word, if you got the right seed, if you got the right supply, that seed is developing even when you don't think you are. Even when you think you're sleeping, the seed is growing. He says the word will keep you. And when you wake up, the word is what will speak to you. Now, I need you to hear this because I told you the definition of sleep is the immobil immobility of the bodily function despite of the conscious mobility. What does that mean? That means the members of your the members in your mind is working even when your body is not right so you're there watch this but he says when you wake up that word that was working is that word is going to speak to you meaning here we go therefore in order for you to wake up with a different morning you must lay down with a different mind god jesus in order for you to wake up to a different morning, you must lay down with a different mind. What he's, he said, you cannot, uh, you cannot expect something to speak to you that you didn't first lay down with when you, before you went to sleep. Whatever, whatever words you slept with is the word that you, that's going to speak to you when you wake up. If you slept with an attitude, you're waking up with one. 
If you slept with uh, d d d dissension, you're waking up with dissension. If you slept with uh, negativity, you're waking up with negativity. He says, whatever word that you slept with, that's the word that's going to speak to you. So you can't change your day by changing your day. <laughs> you change your day by changing what you lay down with before you have your day begins. Before your day begins, it is determined by the things that you have uh, 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 on your mind, the things that you have in your mind before you see what's in your life. What you see in your life is a deflection, a reflection, I should say, is a reflection of what's on your mind. You lay down with it. That's why you woke up with it. You lay down with it. That's why you woke up with it. So therefore, here's the question. You ready for the question? Whatever thoughts, here it is, whatever thoughts you have intercourse with, is that the type of morning you're having intimacy with right now? Ask yourself, is my morning intimacy a reflection of my thoughts intercourse? What, uh, whatever is the course of my thoughts, is that what you see in me, into me? Is that what I see in myself in the morning? Whatever course my thought got on, is that how I see myself in the daylight? Because intercourse reflects intimacy. That's why your Bible uses the word new to talk about intercourse, because it, it determines knowledge before concept or conception, meaning knowledge produces something. It births something out. That's why the Bible says he knew you. It means that you had intimacy with it. The question is, what do you know? Because what you know determines what you see and what you see determines what you give birth to. And the reason why you are conceiving certain mornings is because you're, you're sleeping with certain mindsets. Your day can't change until your night does. Huh. Huh. You, 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 you can't, you can't expect change. Watch this. You can't expect change where, where you will not have the, 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 the discipline. I'm going to use that word. Well, you won't have the discipline to make hard choices when you want to see change because change comes by hard choices. It was it was um, I think it was uh, George uh, George B Bernard Shaw. I think that's I think he's the one who said yeah, George Bernard Shaw. He said change. Watch this. He says progress. So he says progress is impossible without change. Progress is impossible without change. You can't go for it until you change something. Like you, you, it, unless you change where you are to where you're going, you can't go forward. Any area of your life, you must have changed in order to see progress. So if you're expecting to see progress in your life, you got to ask yourself, what are you, what, what are you having to change in order to see that progress? And too many times we're changing the wrong things. We're trying to change the physical things in order to see physical progress. But if you understand your Bible and your Bible said in Hebrews chapter 11, what does it say? Hebrews 11 and 1, you know, there's now faith in the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not yet seen. But verse number two says this, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. And three says this, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which were watch this the things which were seen were not made were not made were not made by the things which are visible he says if you want to see change in the visible it didn't start in the visible the change that, that you see in the visible or the things that you see in the visible must start by changing in the spiritual it must start by the word of God he says the word the word of God framed the, the ages or the world it framed it so the question is watch this if the word of God framed it the question is what lenses am I looking through to see it if I'm not looking through the right lenses, then I may not see the right frame. God already framed it. So it's not a matter of God needed to, 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 to reframe or, or, or reframe his frame. I told you Sunday, we got to reframe our frame and we need to change our frame. But God doesn't need to change his frame. He's already framed it. Sometimes we need to change our lenses to look through his frames. He's already shaped it out. He's already put a construct around it. It's already what God says. And watch this. Prayer is asking God to show you his frame so your faith can align up with his frame. Show me how this is going to end, God, so I can stop worrying. <laughs> show me what's going to happen so I can start stop having meltdowns like I'm big enough. And that's the thing. That's what I mean by change. Like you got to you got to be strong enough and confident enough and courageous enough to ask God to show you. What's going to change so that you can align yourself with the difficulty that's on the way? God, I'm big enough. Ha give it to me right now. I don't know about you, but I'm, I, listen, I'm, I can handle it. I would rather deal with it now than wait to have to get it by surprise and deal with it later. Give it to me today. Let me see it right now. 
Let, let me see it. And he says, don't deny my word as long as it's as long as it's called today, which means I'll give you what you need. I'll give you your, your bread today if you can eat it. Can you eat it? Ask somebody, can you eat it? Like, can you can you eat? Can you eat what God is telling you to change, even though it doesn't always suit your comfort of what you want to see? Peter said, Peter said, be serious about being watchful in prayer because the end of all things are at hand. He says, you got to be serious about this thing. Like, I'm not just trying to give you some religious rhetoric. I'm trying to get you to understand that when you're watching and praying, God will reveal what he's already framed in the world so you can be prepared with the warning. But you got to be serious about this. OK, here it is. Here we go. Here we go. So sleep, the immobility, right? This the immobility of bodily function, despite of conscious mobility, meaning I'm aware consciously, but I'm not moving into it. Watch this. Watching, therefore, then is the ability to see where I need to move and to begin to move into the thing I, I need to move into because I can now see it. So consciously is not just my conscious state being mobile, but it's also my members aligning with my conscious. I'm going to work to align the body to get in alignment with my with, with what my consciousness is already aware of. Whatever I'm seeing mentally or whatever I'm seeing spiritually, I'm going to align my life to, to be in alignment with it physically. I'm going to get in alignment. I'm going to start working my body. Why? Because I'm watching. I'm not just sleeping and seeing a consciousness of movement and no, don't have my members to align with it. No, I'm watching because I'm trying to be aware of what's about to happen so I can align my life with it. I'm going to change before everybody else does. Come on. I'm going to make a decision before everybody else does. Why? Because I'm watching while you worrying. I'm watching while, while you over here disagreeing. I'm watching and my watch should produce a work in me that caused me to change. That's why it's called the watch hours. Right. Because prayer is a work. Come on here. Prayer is a work. So when you have these watch hours, you're working in prayer to change something that nobody can see yet, but that you can Hey, I hope I hate it. I got happy right there. I'm sorry. When you have these watch hours, I said I'm going to keep it melatonin. I'm coming down. When you have these watch hours, you're working in prayer to see something. I got shot and shot and said, hey, I'm, you're working in prayer to see something. Watch this so you can change something that nobody else can see yet. Th that's why you have the watch hours. And we talked about the two restor uh, restorative intercession and pr protective revelation. I'm going to give you the other two and we get out of here. Here it is. Number, th number three, this is the third watch hour. This is from 12 p.m., excuse me, 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. From 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. And if I said, if I said 9 p.m. To, to 12 p.m., I apologize. 9 p.m. to 12 a.m., I hope I said that, but if I didn't, forgive me, I know my time. And this, this watch hour is from 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. This is the darkest hour of the day. This is where you enter your deepest sleep, what something called the REM, R-E-M, the REM state. This is where you are the deepest in your sleep. This is where the most demonic activity occur. 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. This is why, because this is, at, this is at your darkest hour. This is at your most prevalent sleep. Anytime you are the sleepiest, Satan is on the prowl the most. He, he, he's, he's not waiting for you to be strong to fight you. No, he's waiting for you to be the weakest, the darkest, the, the most in the, the area of your most ignorance. He, he's coming to the, the, the weakest part of you. Why? Because he understands that when you're asleep, you get seed. That's Matthew 13. Come on here. The Bible says in Matthew 13 that, 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 that the swords went out to sow and they sow uh, wheat into the field. And while men slept, an enemy came and sold tears. Why? Because it's when you're sleeping is when you're supposed to get seed. So if I don't fill the place with seed, he has room to plant his seed inside of me. He can't plant his seed inside of a garden that's filled with seed already. Come on here. He can't plant it. He can't plant his seed inside of a place that's already filled with seed. And, and, and when the Bible says when it grew up, uh, they, they went to the master and said, uh, what, what, what is this? We planted wheat. These are tares. He says the enemy did this. And they said, should we put them up? He said, no, let them both grow together. Grow, grow together. What is that? That's God showing his mercy to us to say, I know that you got some good stuff in you, but I also know that you got some bad stuff in you. And I'm not going to let the bad stuff outgrow the good stuff. If you're going to grow bad, baby, you're going to grow good. I need to talk to somebody right there because I need you to stop 
feeling guilty about the things you've done. Yeah, you messed up. You made some bad decisions. You made some bad mistakes. We all have. I know I have. We all make some bad choices. But baby, he says just as much as the bad grow. Come on here. The good go, 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 is going to grow with it. That's a, that's a tongue twister. The good is going to grow with it. Your good is growing at the same level your bad. So watch this. Tell your mind. Here your seed. God, I feel him. I'm trying my best, but I'm getting happy. Here is your seed. The next time the enemy tries to tell you that you're making bad decisions, God says, I gave you a rebuttal. Say the same way that you see me making a lot of bad ones, it's the same way you're going to see me making a lot of good ones. Because God said both going to grow together. You can't have more bad than good. My king already told me that if you grow this one, he growing that one. It ain't this or that. It's this end that. So I'm finna outgrow you, baby, because I know it grows to... Yeah, okay. All right. Young man, calm down. I be talking to myself sometimes. I got to get myself together. I be happy. <laughs> I be happy. No, I, and I hope I'm helping somebody. Listen, I, I really do. Because it blessed me to understand, it, it, especially in the season of my life um, that I'm in, it blessed me to understand that you have to, you have to be aware. You have to be aware of not just what's happening around you when you're woke, but you have to be aware of what's happening around you when you're trying to sleep. Come on here. And people are watching you while you sleep. The enemy is watching you while you sleep. Your, your persecutors are watching you while you sleep. The people who want you to fail are watching you while you sleep. That's how people, God, I'm trying to like, that's how, that's how certain cultures and certain markets make money because they are paying attention to you sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Their marketing is based off you not being woke in your life. Take that one. So number three, here it is. Let me get out of here. Number three, here it is. You ready? The third watch, territorial authorization. Territorial authorization. What is that? That's Matthew chapter 25. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus gives a parable about uh, ten, 10 virgins, five wise, five foolish, um, and they all go out to meet the bridegroom and they all have oil. Now, at, 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 in verse number six says this, at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Say coming. Okay, I ain't in church. Nobody was say, <laughs> go, the, the, the ants and the flies said, come in, come on. Go out and meet them. Then those virgins, watch this, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lips. And the foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, no, lest, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. He says at midnight he cried, then they trimmed their lips. So this is post midnight. They're trimming their lamps. They trimmed their lamps. This is after midnight. They're having a conversation beyond the midnight hour. So we're in the third watch. You with me? We're in the, what they, what, what, and I'll show you this in Mark chapter 13. It's, it's the, called the, uh, the cock crow watch. The, what the, the crow cocks. The crow, the crow is cocking. The, 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 the crow watch, the, the cock crow watch. I'll show you in just a moment because it makes sense <laughs> if I put it together. So let me put it together. Let me, let me, let me, let me spoon feed it. Here it is. They're, they're trimming their lamps. The, 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 the five who did not have oil, they asked for their, they asked for oil. The, the five who did say, no, lest we not have enough. When they leave to go buy, the, uh, the Bible says that uh, the, the, the bridegroom has now come and then the virgins who has the oil go into the meeting or they go meet him, the bridegroom. This is happening between 12 and three. This, Jesus actually said this. He says, if I come at the third watch or the second watch or the third watch, you better be aware. It, it wasn't implying that he's gonna become between like 9 p.m. and 3 a.m. He's not giving you that distinctive because he said no angel, uh, no, no, no person in heaven, no person on earth, no angels. Nobody knows the time of the day that the father has said uh, before time. So he, he, he's not giving us an exact time, but he's saying even at your darkest moment, if I come, you better be you better be ready to light it up. <laughs> you better be ready to light it up. You better you better have enough revelation for your illumination that you get your transformation. Come on here. You better have enough revelation for your illumination that you get your transformation. He says, because when I show up in your life, I need you to have illumination so I can get you this transformation. If you don't have enough oil to illuminate, then you will have enough. Watch this revelation to transform. If you can't see what's inside of you, I can't change what's inside of you. You got to be able to see it. And because these these foolish versions didn't have oil or didn't have enough oil to light it up. 
they had to miss out on what the people who did have oil got into. What was he, what was happening? He says, watch this. When he came, the cry was heard and those who had oil trimmed their lips and, 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 and they waited to go in, which means that they illuminated the area or the space they were at. They had authority over the territory because they had enough oil to illuminate the light of the darkness that was around them. Territorial authorization, come on here, says that when God puts me in the place of darkness, I got enough in me to light it up. Whoo! The reason why most people can't wake up between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. is, oh, God, help me right here, Holy Ghost. I don't know why you got me saying this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm out here. I might as well go and jump in. I'm in the deep. The reason why most people don't wake up between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m., especially to pray, is because they don't have authorization in their territory yet. You got to have enough oil haha <laughs> to cast out devils between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. y'all ain't talking to me you gotta have enough oil to not do nothing foolish between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. you gotta have enough oil to not have that call late at night at 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. you gotta have enough oil to not answer back the text that that W.Y.D. that's between two come on here somebody you gotta have enough oil to say no to what your flesh want to say yes to between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. you gotta have enough oil to be able to stand up and say this ain't who I want to be uh, right now but my God I not I'm not who I used to be I'm gonna make a decision today that I probably didn't make yesterday or last week or last month or last year you gotta be able to have enough oil to stand up and say I know who I am and I know who I am. I got enough in me to say no to you and yes to him. I got enough in me to say no, you can't have none of this and yes, he can have all of it. Between 12 a.m. and 3 a.m. it's going to take some oil, baby. It's going to take some oil. It's going to take some oil. It's going to take you having authority in a territory in order for you to have an illumination of transformation to get what God has for you. That's the hour. That's the hour where territories are shifted. Come, oh God, the darkest hours is when you have the, the darkest hours is when you have the most disbursement of destiny. What, what do you mean by disbursement of destiny? I mean, when, when there is, a, when there is a, a, a shifting or when there is a changing of destiny, it happens at the darkest hour. It don't happen during the light. It happens in the dark, baby. That's when God shifts everything in your life during the darkest hours. I need to talk to somebody who know what it feels like to be in a dark place, to let you know God is about to shift something in your life. You ain't in the dark darkest hour of your life just, just to be in the dark. God said, this is when I can shift and people will see that you got enough oil for me to put you in the place I want you to be in. You got enough pressing to be in the place I want you to be in. I push you and I press you and I charge you and you are still standing. That's the oil of accumulation to get you to your next when you're in your darkest moment. Because, I know, because you have to have illumination for revelation to get your transformation. Territorial authorization says, I can see where nobody else can. Whew. I, I see what's happening in this territory when you don't. Come on, come on. Hey, this, look at, let, let me back it up with scripture. Acts 27, let, let me find it. Acts 27, thank you Holy Ghost. Let me find Acts 27. I gotta get out of here. Acts 27, um, Let's see if I can put it up on my phone. The, Paul is Paul is Paul is on on his way to Rome in Acts chapter twenty seven. He's on his way to Rome. He's 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 um, appealed to Caesar. He's taking these ships to Rome, and he's on a ship where they they're about to have a shipwreck. Come on here, here it is, and they're about to have a shipwreck. And and, and as he's on this ship, um, they're at the fourteenth night. This is what uh, verse number twenty. Acts twenty seven twenty seven. I'm going to start there. I'm going to just read it. He's on the 14th night with these people. Here it is. We were being driven across the Adriatic Sea. Watch this. When about midnight, the sailors sensed that they were approaching the land. They took soundings. This is the NIV version and found that the water was 120 feet deep. So they, they mean they, they, they took they took they took their measuring uh, tool and, they, and their equipment and they measured the depth of the sea. And it was 120 feet deep. Watch this. And then a short time later, they took another sounding and it was 90 feet deep. So they mean they're getting closer to the shore. But it says sometime later. That means it's after midnight. Come on here. We're in the third watch. I want you to see this. But they're getting closer to the shore and they feel like they're moving too fast. Watch what happens. Verse Verse number 29, fearing, this is what happens, fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks. They dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. Come on here. When you cannot handle darkness, you start praying for daylight.
When the darkness becomes too much, you start asking God for daylight. And God says, I put you in the dark, not for you to get in the day, but for you to change the dark into the light. You are the light of the world. Oh, God, help me, Jesus. Oh, God, don't let fear. Oh, help me right here. Don't let fear drive you out of the place where faith is supposed to take over. Don't let fear drive you out of the place where faith is supposed to take over. You're supposed to be there, not the daylight. Your light is supposed to be there. They're praying for daylight because they don't know the light that's inside of them. But Paul does. Watch here. Can I finish reading it? V verse number where we at 30. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let down the lifeboats down to the sea, pretending they were going. Uh, they were going to uh, lower some anchors from the boat. So they putting down these life rafts. They're about to jump off this thing. They say we finna hit this and crash. I'm getting out of here. Then Paul, verse 31, said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. Did you hear what he just said? He said, unless they stay on the boat, you're going to die. Why? Because territory that I have is in the ship, not in the sea. Oh, God, if they say if they stay here because you are accountable to their life, because you are on their watch and they're and they're up under your tutelage. He's talking to the head chief, the centurion, the soldier. He said they're up under you. You're going to have to pay for their decisions because they're in your territory. If they jump off, it's my well, you might as well jump with them because God has given me authority. Come on here. Territorial authorization in this ship. I wish somebody said God gave me authority in my house. I wish somebody would say, God gave me authority in this car. I wish somebody would remind Satan that the reason God got me on this job is not for me to jump ship. It's for me to change the course thereof. I got territory, baby. Paul says you got to uh, get them to stay on here. And when they stay on the ship, you'll be saved, too. So the soldiers, what they do, cut the rope. They cut it off. Somebody said they cut it off because because here it is. He was one of the things God told me, because whenever watch this, whenever there is apprehension, you got to start praying about separation whenever there is apprehension you got to start praying about separation the reason why people are fearing something is because something that's attached to them shouldn't be attached to them or something that's attached to you shouldn't be attached to you so apprehension of something means you got to separate yourself from something else it may be doubt it may be people it may be jobs it may be situations it may be books it may be conversations it may be time it may be family it may it, it may be yourself baby you got to start praying about separation when you start feeling apprehension because apprehension comes because you are connected to something that's pulling you down from what you're supposed to be. You are bigger than that. You're braver than that. You have more courage than that. You got more confidence than that. You have to pray about separation when you start feeling apprehension. I hope that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Paul says, I got territorial authorization on here. Watch this. And the reason why, and Mark, let me give it to you. Mark 13, because I told you I was going to give it to you. It says this, Mark 13. Mark 13, I'm going to just read, I'm going to just read the, 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 the context. I'm going to just read the text, not the context. Verse 35, I just want to give you this. Watch, this is Jesus. Therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming in the evening, first watch, at midnight, second watch, at the crowing of the rooster or the, or, or the cock crowing, the third watch, or in the morning, that's the fourth watch. He, he, he lays it out for us. It's in your Bible. Mark 13 and 35. Read 32, at least 32 to 37 when you get a chance. Read that. Why? Because it's going to let you see that he gave everybody, every servant, he says, authority over a watch. You have authority over a watch. You have authority over a territory and you got to you got to start understanding that territorial authorization. Why? Because in the watch this in Matthew, this is Matthew. I'm reading. Uh, I, I started in Matthew 25 about the parable and Matthew 26. It's, it's called the it's called the, 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 the crowing of the rooster, or the cock crowing hour. And Matthew 26, the crew, the, the, the rooster crows, uh, uh, the rooster cock is Cock crows, I, something like that. The, the, the cock crows, the rooster crow, the rooster, the rooster starts crowing. And during that time, if you remember your Bible, Peter denies Christ. Come on, that's the, tw that, that's the third watch. Why? Because, watch this, whenever you have territorial authorization, the enemy was all, will always try to tempt you with rejection. 
it will always try to tempt you to reject something about you. Reject yourself, reject your mind, reject your abilities, reject your authority. And when the spirit of rejection comes, you got to remind yourself about authorization. That's why it's called, you know, a, a debit card. You have to put in your pen to confirm you have authorization to access what's on this card. If you don't have the pen, then what's going to happen? The ATM is going to reject you because rejection comes at the expense of authorization. Authorization dispels rejection, but rejection should compel you to get your authorization. Uh, whenever there is rejection, you got to pray about authorization. Yes, you listen, whenever somebody rejects you, you got to ask God, do I have authorization over this situation? Am I authorized to change it? Because if I'm not, I need to go to my territory. If I can't, I need to go to my territory. You're not authorized to take somebody else's husband. That's why it's not your territory. Throw it out there, pastor. Fling it. <laughs> you can't pray, come on here, about a man rejecting you when he's married because you don't have territorial authorization. Come on here, somebody. Come on here, somebody. Don't leave me out here. Somebody better give me an amen right there. Territorial authorization says, God, I need to know if I got if I got authorization in this territory, I need to know because somebody is rejecting me. If they're rejecting me and I got authorization, then I'm changing their rejection to my authorization. I got the access. I got the pen. God, give me the password. Give me the passcode. Whatever I need to do to make sure this territory abides up under your kingdom, I will do it because I have authorization where they think they have rejection. It's not happening today. The third watch. Territorial authorization. We, because the darkest hour reveals the brightest lights. The darkest hour reveals the brightest lights. That's why, that's why he used the parable of the oil. You got to have oil for this hour. Got to have oil for this hour. Yeah, you got to have oil for this hour. But he may show up in your life in that hour. And you got to wake up. Watch this. Believing that you have the oil. Don't reject what God has already. Don't reject what God has already approved. If he woke you up, that means you're confirmed. If he woke you up, that means you that mean you got the authorization code. If he woke you up, that means it's yours to dominate. Dominate the territory. Don't let it dominate you. Come on, Keisha. Here it is. Number four. Somebody caught that. Number four. I'm done. I'm done. Going into the morning watch. Merciful elevation. Merciful elevation. What, what, what do you mean merciful elevation? The morning watch from, from, from uh, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. is always the time where you see an elevating of something out of mercy. That, that's where the children of Israel actually came to the other side of the Red Sea. We, we, we talked about that Sunday. Again, go check out that message. If you didn't see it, you'll see it. that's when they came to the other side. That's when, that's when Jacob was holding on to the angel. And the angel said, the day is about to break. That means it was about to be 6 a.m. He's, he's in the morning watch. And Jacob said, I won't let you go until you bless me. Jacob name means trickster. God, uh, the angel said, what is your name? He said, Jacob, he said, your, your name is no longer Jacob, but it's Israel. What did he do? He says, I'm blessing you. Watch this. I'm elevating you, even though you don't deserve it. Even though you tricked your brother, even though you tricked Laban, even though you're li you living a life of tri a, a, a trickery, I'm giving you elevation out of my mercy. I need somebody to catch that because I need you to understand that elevation is not predicated on your mistakes. It's predicated on his mercy. He says, if you get in me, oh God, in the early morning watch, if you seek me early, if you get in my face first, if you seek you first, if you wake up with me on your mind, if you stop hitting that alarm clock three, four, five, six, seven, eight times uh, in the morning. If you roll yourself out of bed, if you pull yourself together, if you shake your wig on your head, if you can get into his presence, if you can humble yourself, if you can pray in that hour, he says, I'll give you an elevation that you don't deserve. I'll give you something that no man can say that they gave it to you and no man can take it away from you. If you can get yourself up, I'll change your name from trickster to prince with God. If you can get yourself out the bed, he says, I'll make you watch what Jesus did in the fourth watch. It's the fourth watch where Jesus started walking on the water. Why? Because it was a merciful elevation. He says, I'll make you walk on what people are drowning in. If you can get up, oh God, somebody, 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 somebody say, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Stop letting them watch you sleep. Get up. Get up. He said, there's a merciful elevation I want to take you to, but you have to get into my presence and watch at a certain time, at a certain hour, because sometimes the only time you can hear God is when you can't hear nobody else. When everybody else is asleep is when you need to be woke. When everybody else is busy, that's when you need to be free. He says, I need you to stop asking me to give you more hours and I need you to start changing your hours into, into more time with me. I'll give you, I'll redeem the time if you can walk circumspectly. Come on here, Ephesians. 
I'll, I'll give it back to you. But for some, the morning is easy. So for, for, for some others, it's the 6 p.m. that you need restorative intercession. For others, you need to understand there's a protective revelation because you are, you're fearful in your life. You keep walking, you don't think God got you. He got you covered, boo. He got you covered. Then there's others where you have to understand territorial authorization that you are authorized to be in the place. That you gotta start praying. If God put me in a room where it happened, come on here. We get, we get into our movies tonight. Put me in a room where it happened. Put me in a room where it happened. Put me in a room, watch this, where you've given me access and I don't even understand it because I don't, I, I, I don't deserve what you've given me, but your access has allowed me to walk into a territorial authorization because you're giving me merciful elevation. Just, just show me where you've given me access. Show me where you need me to take over. There are some people, and I'm gonna say this, there are some people that's supposed to be building things, teams, sports teams, book teams, ministry teams, but you're, but, you're, but you're waiting for them to come to you in a place and God says they're not gonna be there because I didn't give you authorization in that place. You gotta go to them, go into all the world. You have to go in, and, and when you go, watch this, there's a mercy waiting on you in the place where you don't think you're supposed to be because I gave you authorization before I gave you elevation. If you, if you got elevation, you better believe you got authorization. You are, you are in a place where God is trying to get you to take over and not take sides. Thank you, Bishop Eddie Loan. Come on. Trying to get you to not compromise. He's trying to get you to understand that here it is, and I'm done. He's trying to get you to understand that wherever there is limitation, he's trying to get you to understand that you need to pray with imagination. <sighs> don't pray, watch this, don't pray with just capability or ability, meaning praying based off what you think can happen or what you think you can do to make happen. Don't ask God to you, no, pray by imagination where you see limitation. That's why Peter said, if it's you bit me to come on the water. Cause I, I imagine <laughs> if you can do it, I may not have seen it. I may not have the recollection for it. I may not have a reference for it. I may not even deserve it, but I have the imagination where the enemy put in limitation and whatever you can do, God help me. When the enemy starts to tempt you with limitation, I just need you to start praying with imagination. I just need you to, uh, watch this, I need you to go past the natural into the super. I need you to start asking God for crazy stuff. When he says, oh, you know you ain't gonna pay your bills, you just did, God give me a mansion on the hill. God give, give, give me a Rolls Royce right now. When your car break down, you say, oh, that's why you ain't got no gas. God, I just need you to own, own a deal ship right just start praying with imagination and not reside to limitation I need you to understand that you have been authorized to, to uh, oversee a watch and we need you watching we need you watching the body of Christ has too many believers to not be able to take the world by storm the Bible says if one can chase a thousand two ten how many can two million do come on he don't need everybody he just need the people to get in the place who he's given the watch to. You know the time nor the hour when the when the Bible says he says you don't know the time nor the hour when he's coming. If you understand the kingdom, if I've done any halfway decent job of teaching the kingdom, the kingdom is now and is meaning it's present and futuristic. That's the kingdom. The kingdom, he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Then he says, you don't know the time where the, uh, the father will restore the kingdom. It's, it's a today kingdom and it's a future kingdom. That means whenever he talks about, watch this, whenever he talks about him coming, he ain't just talking about him coming back. He's also talking about him coming now. You don't know the time or the hour God wants to bless you. Ah, help me, Holy Ghost. Help me. I feel that right there. God says some of your blessings, come on here, it's, it's held up. Because your sleep is too long. Because, because you won't get up. 
Your blessings is held up. And he says, some of you got to change. Watch this. Not your strategy, but your schedule. If you would just come on here, if you would just change your watch, I'm, I'm moving you into a new watch because I've given you new territory to have authorization over. I'm moving you into a new, uh, new watch because I've given you revelation for a new protection. I'm moving you into a new watch because I've given you the power of intercession for restoration. I'm moving you into a new watch because you have elevation where other people don't because you have a merciful elevation in your life. I'm moving you into a new watch, but I need you to change your schedule to align with me and not me align with your schedule. Oh, for God to sacrifice a praise. Yes, it's going to cost you something. Yes, it's going to hurt. Yes, it's going to be tiring. Yes, you probably could have got an extra 30 minutes. But what, does that extra 30 minutes that you get asleep, does that really change your seasons? Are you still waking up in the same season even though you got a new temperature in your life? Uh, eh, eh. Even though the temperature of your house has changed, you in the same season. Huh. Your wife temperature changed and you in the same season. Your husband temperature changed and you in the same season. God says you got to shift your season, baby. You smarter than the ant. You got to put more seed in you. Before you sleep, plant. Before you sleep, go get it. Before you sleep, change what's on your mind. Because what you change on your mind will change the mornings in your life. Watch and pray. Father, I pray right now for the men and women of God who are watching and praying. For those who have a desire to pray, I, I, I pray that they understand that prayer is not a posture. Prayer is not a tradition. Prayer is not even a culture or, or, or a, a cult. Prayer is a, a customization. Prayer is, is a line and design to the individual. How you pray is how you pray. Huh. We just need you to do it. How, how you get into the presence of God is how you get in there. God just wants you to be there. It, it's customized to you. And I pray that they understand whatever it is that they ask, whatever is on their mind, you want to hear it, you want it, you know it, you put it there to share it with you, whatever watch, whatever time, that you are a God who never sleeps nor slumbers, so you are always ready to answer. Give them the spirit of prayer. Give them the faith to watch. Give them the courage to see and not to be blind by what's coming against them. Father, I pray for oil, anointing, fire, and strength to exude from your people. That they will light up the darkest hours of their life. That they will be the light, the true light of the world. Not of the church, but of the world. Every marketplace, every merchandise, every area of manufacturing, put a light there, Jesus. One of your believers, one of the people who are listening to me, put them in a place. That's why somebody, I, I felt this, that's why somebody is either in a, in a transition of jobs, of homes, of, 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 of relationships. He says, because I'm putting you in a new place of authorization and I need you to recognize. I need you to recognize the watch I'm calling you to. And I need you to, to get an alignment and change your habits of sleeping because you've been called to change the outcome of a new season. Power is coming from your people. And they will make thy will be done and thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Hey man, I love you. You can't do nothing about it. Just enjoy it. God bless you.